Great. Okay, I'm going to get started. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, container platforms as equalizers, running health services across the world. So to start out, I'm just going to introduce myself and the company I work for. Um, my name's Jamie. Uh, I'm based in Johannesburg in South Africa. And I'm a site reliability engineer. And recently, I've also taken on the role of tech ambassador, which is a fancy name for I spend a bit of my time making talks like this and uh, writing and editing uh, our technical blog. Um, that's my Twitter handle and GitHub, if you want to reach me there. Um, I work for a nonprofit organization called Prekelt.org. Um, it was founded in 2007 and it's based in South Africa. Um, and we aim to use mobile technologies to solve some of the world's largest social problems. Um, and the way we do this uh, is we use open source technology and Pretty much everything we make is also open sourced. Um, and we build scalable platforms that give people access to information and services, um, particularly on mobile devices, and particularly with regards to healthcare. Um, I also just want to talk very briefly about nonprofits and like the way they work. Um, what we do is we develop projects in partnership with our funders and various other stakeholders. Um, and there's lots of different projects going on at any one time. Um, we just, there's never like one thing happening. And these projects vary in size. So some of them can be quite large and uh, last a long time or even indefinitely um, and can be like at a national scale. Or in some cases, we do much smaller things that are, say like a, a targeted study on a very targeted group for a certain amount of time. Um, so they vary. Um, on the right are some of our sort of better known services. I don't have that much time to talk about them, but I will talk a bit about Mom, you know, um later in the presentation. Uh, so I, one of the things I've kind of enjoyed doing as um, in this kind of tech ambassador role is uh, spending some time and looking back at some of the technical decisions we've made and why. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about how we ended up using containers and container orchestration. So this is back in, 2014 and earlier. Um, so the influence to get us onto containers kind of came from two areas in the company. So um, some of our projects uh, fall under what I call like the youth projects. And these are, have historically mostly been sort of mobile sites, um, specifically targeted at like really low end phones, sometimes not even smartphones, or sometimes sites like even without JavaScript. Um, and they often integrate with social media. Uh, and they have a focus on education in general and particularly sexual and reproductive health. Um, and in this case, we wanted to be able to run lots of these sites. I'm going to talk about why. Um, so the way we used to do this way back in the day is like you start up a VM, you set up your app, we're Python shop, and we do lots of Django stuff. And so you have a web server, an app, and a database of some kind. And this is very, very basic and not cloud native. Um, but sometimes this kind of made sense because you'd have a funder and that funder would fund some projects and each project you just give it a server or a VM and sometimes the project didn't last that long and then you just shut down the VM when you're done. Um, it was kind of simple to manage. Um, but eventually you end up doing more of these and they start looking similar. So you use configuration management, which is very like 10 year old technology. Um, and this sort of works, you can just punch out more of these things, but um, you have some problems. You have like multiple databases you're now managing. Um, you also like, a big thing is resource utilization. So often a single site doesn't need a whole VM. Um, yeah, uh, so the next thing we did was kind of just run lots of sites on each VM um, and then kind of break out the database into a better managed separate unit. Um, obviously, this also has issues. It's like how many do you, how many sites do you put on each server? Who knows? Um, you know, if one server goes down, suddenly you lose a lot of sites. Um, and how do you get like the right code to the right server, given that you've kind of arbitrarily chosen where to run these things? Um, so it's kind of obvious that this is kind of heading towards container orchestration. So for these like youth-related projects and mobile sites, what we wanted to do was. First of all, just make more efficient usage of resources. It's very important. Uh, we wanted to automate recovery when a host went down. And we wanted to also just make it easier to deploy code. Um, 
So then from the other side, uh, we have some projects which kind of fall under the umbrella of health projects. Um, and these have historically been much more messaging based. Um, so we reach and interact with users over technologies that work on just any phone, like SMS, USSD, and most recently WhatsApp. And these projects have been more focused on maternal health and early childhood development. Um, so back in like 2014 and earlier, we had this thing called Vumi. You can kind of think of it as like a very customized Twilio. It was our tool for working with SMS and USSD, integrating with various aggregators and uh, carriers in different parts of the world. Um, you could develop message flows and message sets for users um, in a web UI or in JavaScript. And it had this like fancy message store where we store all the messages in Rick in AWS and Ireland. So it's kind of really product of its time. Um, so a big problem with this is that Ireland is quite far away from where a lot of our users are. Um, and you basically have this like 200 millisecond round trip time. Um, and that's not even taking into account the time to actually look up the data. And then when you get to uh, South Africa or wherever it may be, you have like a 2G or 3G quite high latency network. So this became a problem. Um, here's a list of some of the ping times between AWS data centers and Johannesburg, where I'm based. Um, the best you can do is basically 180 milliseconds to somewhere in Central Europe, which is not great. Um, you may be wondering, is there really no way closer and better? And the answer is no. Um, there are no um, like kind of first class cloud data centers anywhere in Africa yet. Um, that tweet is a little bit old, it's from 2016. So there are quite a few CDN points of presence in Africa now. Um, and then on the right, just my colleague Simon Dahan has kind of searched through his Twitter feed and he goes to all these like international conferences and these big tech companies announce their fancy global technology and invariably they kind of don't have a present in, presence in Africa, which is not great. Um, so I just wanted to quickly explain USSD. This is a technology we use quite a lot at the time and we still use today. Um, it's maybe not so familiar to people in the States or in Europe, um, but it's basically supported on pretty much every mobile phone ever made. Um, if you ever dial like a star number, like star one, two, three hash, um, can bring up like a menu and you can do some very basic interactions. And we actually use this um, to provide uh, health information to people. Um, yeah, and it's session based. It's also very latency sensitive, um, has a maximum duration and build by time. So latency can be an issue. Um, so for these like health projects, what we wanted to do was first of all, just lower the latency by moving our infrastructure closer to the actual users. Um, also, another thing is that these services are typically, we do them in partnership with government organizations. We need the data to be in-country. And also, this uh, Amam Connect platform in particular in South Africa was kind of really uh, gaining traction at this time. So we wanted to be able to scale to support these new users. Um, so finally, we moved on to containers. And we're into 2015, still quite far back. Um, so at my organization, there are a few things that made this a lot more urgent um, in 2015. Uh, we partners, partnered with Facebook and their free basics platform to provide certain services for free to users um, on the internet.org platform. Um, and Facebook wanted to launch in a lot of countries uh, really quickly. Uh, so we wanted to deploy, the, the easiest way to do that was to just deploy lots and lots of copies of these like Django Mobi sites. Um, we also started an incubator with 100 new sites. We suddenly had this like explosion in sites. And then on the health side, like I said, um, the services in South Africa were kind of taking off. And also uh, Protection of Personal Information Act, or POPI, is kind of our local equivalent of GDPR, which was starting to come into effect. Um, so we really needed the data to be in country. And in the cloud native space, um, yeah, uh, what stuff was starting to get standardized. Uh, Kubernetes hit version 1.0, Cloud Native Compute Foundation form, Docker still early days, 1.4 to 1.9. Um, and, but it was starting to be standardized. They started the Open Container Project, which I think is now known as OCI. Um, so at that point, we decided to choose containers and invest in this. And at the time, we actually didn't choose Kubernetes. We chose Mises and Marathon. And there are a few reasons for this. And this the main one's probably just, it seemed simpler. 
Um, there are fewer upfront technology decisions, uh, fewer independent components, because it's less sort of microservice-y like design. Um, you don't have to buy into a networking model for IP per pod or anything like that. And Marathon, and Marathon provides this really nice abstraction for, uh, well, really simple abstraction for running apps where you just run a certain number of instances of an app. It also had an emphasis on things we were interested in, like uh, resource constraints. Again, we wanted to make good use of resource, uh, good use of our resources. And it also had high availability features, which we thought would be great for running uh, containers in not so reliable hosting environments. Um, and here's just an example of some kind of truncated JSON of Marathon app definitions. Very simple. There's like a name, some number of instances, some amount of CPU and memory, what image, what port, some environment variables to configure it. And then lastly, you can like configure some routes to it. And that's one piece of JSON for like the entire app. Um, so it's much fewer abstractions than something like Kubernetes. And in hindsight, Kubernetes has really taken off a lot. But at the time in 2015, Mises and Kubernetes seemed kind of similar in popularity and maturity. Um, so the next thing we wanted to do was actually replicate our maternal health platform in other countries around the world. And we had this idea for doing this called Seed. Um, and this was around 2016. Uh, this is a list of, uh, uh, this is from actually an internal like learning session at the time. So this is exactly the language we used to talk about these projects. Um, and uh, I just want to highlight a few things quickly. So government, multi-stakeholder, national information system, again, it's all about being like in country, uh, very important, using open source technologies as we always had. Um, and then co-design, we use the sort of co-design process to develop our services. So we have a dedicated service design team who uh, has very vigorous processes for um, developing these projects. Uh, and then finally, the last bit is really important, which is um, we actually intended to kind of hand over these platforms because if we were to go and build a health platform in every single country and then have a presence in all those countries, we'd quickly grow to be like a much larger company than we wanted to be. So how does container orchestration fit in? Um, we hoped it would help us in a few ways. Um, we hoped like high level of automation, self-healing, these kind of good properties would make the platform very self-sufficient. Um, we also had this idea of like these national scale platforms. We wanted to be able to scale to support a whole nation of users. Um, and the biggest thing in the end was really that we had this common platform in different countries. So whether we were deploying in South Africa, Nigeria, Uganda, or AWS in Ireland, we would be able to do it largely the same way. And this did actually work for us. It worked quite well. Um, allowed us to kind of get minimum viable products set up in these different countries very quickly. Um, as soon as uh, my team, the like SRE team, had deployed this container orchestration software, um, the developers could get started really quickly and get things running quite fast. Um, we could also migrate between different hosting providers, which turned out to be really important at times. And we could ultimately kind of treat all these different environments as very similar. Um, but in retrospect, this was also a really ambitious project. Um, I think we kind of tried to do too many things, too many new things at once. So on the right is like a partial architecture of one of, a, of our Nigerian service. Um, and it uses like microservices. And we also had trouble with some of the in-country hosting, still quite new to container orchestration. And we were kind of using too many new fancy technologies. Um, so we kind of uh, spent too many innovation tokens, as they say. Um, but we did deploy this to a few different places. So again, started in South Africa and MomConnect with MomConnect. Um, and that was not a platform to hand over. We still maintain that today um, because we're South African based. Um, but in 2015 and 2016, we built Hello Mama in Nigeria. And then later in 2016, 2017, um, we built Family Connect in Uganda. Uh, there were some, uh, some, some parts of this didn't work out as nicely as we hoped. So high availability, great, um, but it only works up to a point. So here are some of the fun issues we had. 
um, with a hosting provider in Nigeria. And, uh, you know, like Mises did do quite well in retrospect. I mean, it did um, manage to save us in a few cases, but not all cases. And when a complicated distributed system fails, sometimes in a complicated way, sometimes you kind of wish for a simple system that just failed completely and in a predictable way. Um, at one point, all our servers were restarted just out of the blue, and we got this message from the hosting provider. I don't know what it means, really. Um, and uh, in Uganda, we actually had like physical servers which were managed by uh, one of our partners in their office. Um, and this turned out to be more reliable, I think, than Nigeria. But on the other hand, it started with only two physical hosts. And if you use any of these fancy quorum-based technologies, like etc. D or a zookeeper, you know that you kind of need three physical pieces of hardware to have real redundancy. And so um, eventually we had a third system, but yeah. Um, so moving on to 2017, we kind of hit this uh, peak in our clusters. So in Johannesburg, our, our cluster was the biggest one, which was about 30 worker nodes and peaked at about 900 containers. And this was all on like a bare metal system. Again, no like proper cloud in Africa. Uh, we also moved to the open source version of Mesosphere DCOS, which brought some more stability. Um, and at this point, we had like four, a team of four SREs managing clusters in four different countries. Um, so yeah, we were kind of like at the edge of just having too much to manage, I and mean, we probably stretched a bit thin in some areas. Um, and yeah, so these, the Nigerian and Ugandan platforms have actually been handed over now. I don't have much time, don't really have time to talk about it, but the link there, I've written about it. Um, and yeah, I just want to move on to the lessons we learned from this. Um, so getting closer to the present day, um, if you're building infrastructure to hand over to somebody, um, you know, what, what are the concerns? Did we actually do the best we could have? I think the first thing we, the first problem we had was we overestimated the scale of the of the projects. We had this idea of like this national scale project, and that meant it was very big. Um, also, this common platform it certainly benefited us, but did it benefit the people we were handing over to? So we were handing over quite a complex system. Um, yeah. So we kind of were in the situation for a bit, I think, where we had this container orchestrator shaped hammer, and everything looked like a nail. Uh, yeah, so what, what would the ideal system look like? I'm, I'm still really not sure. I mean, maybe not container orchestration. Strange thing to say at KubeCon. Um, you know, would it be a distributed system, or would you just try your best to try and fit that all on just a simple web server? And, um, but we still want portability, and can we do that without container orchestration? And how many of these new shiny technologies are we willing to give up? I don't think we'd be able to move back to a time before containers in our organization. But yeah. Um, but I think for me, the takeaway is that what we should have really done is co-designed the infrastructure as well as the end service. So um, historically, we just do this fancy design process with the eventual product that you know, the user is receiving on their mobile phone. But if we're going to be developing infrastructure to hand over to, then the inheritors of that infrastructure are also end users, and we need to design for them. And we shouldn't really be di di dictating the technology that others should use without their input. Um, and yeah. So we are actually going to be doing this again. Um, we have this, this is still very early stages, but we're looking at deploying this global mums platform. Um, to some new countries, and this will be more uh, WhatsApp-based. Uh, things have changed in the last few years. Um, and finally, uh, I just want to actually talk about Kubernetes and look forward a bit um, So to present day. Um, and I think our problem is that we have to manage so many layers of the stack because we don't have the cloud. So you may be hearing about cool things like Istio, Gain Native, et cetera, but those are really like extra layers on top. Um, and we would love to work on those, but do we have the chance? Um, so when we talk about cloud native technology, you know, which 
cloud is it native to? It's really like the cloud that's available outside of Africa. Um, so going forward, I think what we're planning to do is where we can use the cloud, and there are some cases where we don't have to have stuff in country, um, Kubernetes provides this common API, really, between different cloud providers. And the previous talk in this venue was great. It kind of talked about this idea of, you know, there's never before been this kind of common API from all the cloud providers. Um, but where we can't, still a lot of open questions. Um, I think we're, we can say Linux, not much, Ubuntu. Um, but I think it's OK that we don't really know, because we shouldn't really come in like assuming container orchestration and just using that hammer again. Um, so we are sort of in the process of Kuber moving to Kubernetes. Uh, it's kind of increasingly hard to argue that it's not like the de facto standard now. And the killer feature for us is really the community and the ecosystem. Um, we've just been building things that we wouldn't have to if we were on Kubernetes. Uh, we don't necessarily need every single fancy new feature, um, but we need to not be spending so much time building stuff for our cluster. Um, and Kelsey Hightower has said uh, the price of admission to these modern platforms like Kubernetes is Docker, Docker images, and thankfully we've kind of paid that now. And yeah, so we've kind of had to build some of these things on, on Mesos, and uh, it's not great. Um, at, at first, maybe we didn't have a choice, and we've certainly learned a lot building some of these things, but um, I think it's time to kind of move on. Uh, so this is still kind of more complicated. Kubernetes is still more complicated than we'd like, um, and it, it still moves very fast. Uh, and we would like for there to be some kind of de facto distribution, kind of like an Ubuntu of Kubernetes. Um, at the moment, there's just like hundreds of products, and we can't really pick one and say, this is what we're going to use for all our health platforms, and everybody who inherits these platforms is just going to have to use that. Um, but maybe if there were something more standard, uh, that would be possible. Um, but our strategy is really, when we can use the cloud, just use a managed service and keep it very simple, um, and uh, probably no service meshes for a little while. Um, so for one of our major projects on the more youth side projects, um, we have started using Spinnaker because we can use the clouds. We can start thinking about these uh, like higher level uh, abstractions. Um, and it's kind of great because you can tie together all these various services that we use. We often use like the free and open source versions of things like GitHub and Travis. Um, and we still currently deploy to Mises via DCOS with this. Um, and so what we're trying at the moment is deploying to both DCOS and Kubernetes um, as a way of sort of testing and proving Kubernetes. And um, yeah, so the cool idea of kind of, the cool part of being able to think about these higher level abstractions is that you can change the stuff underneath, um, which is what we're doing. And EKS, Amazon's uh, Kubernetes service is what we're planning to use for this. Um, and then finally, there is some kind of hope on the horizon for cloud in Africa. So um, there are several CDN points of presence, at least, um, mostly Cloudflare. And Akamai has even more. They're not on the map. Um, uh, Azure is supposed to be coming to South Africa like this month, but I haven't really heard anything. And then AWS has a full data center coming to Cape Town in 2020, which is cool but there's still a whole lot of continent kind of between South Africa and Europe. Um, so we'd like to see cloud in more places. Um, yeah, and that's about it. Thank you for coming. And yeah, special thanks to the Linux Foundation for paying for my travel. Um, <laughs>